Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Brian. Hello, my name is Brian Skidmore, and my talk this evening is on supernovae. A supernova is a spectacular explosion of a star. The word, <coughs> the word spectacular doesn't really adequately convey the extraordinary event. Uh, at its brightest, a type 1a supernova has a luminosity of about 5 billion suns. And in my talk this evening, I want to talk to you about the two main mechanisms of supernova explosions, core collapse and the explosion of white dwarf stars. And in particular, I want to talk to you about how the elements of the periodic table are created in, by supernovae. <clears throat> so the presentation will concentrate on some atomic and nuclear physics. Uh, there will be also some information on um, particularly famous supernovae, but the, the emphasis will be on the creation of the elements. So in this uh, beautiful image of the center of the galaxy, uh, the Milky Way, we see <clears throat> what is called the interstellar medium, the medium within which the stars exist. And it consists of the gas and dust that lies between the stars. It is the material from which stars are created. And it is the material to which um, they shed their outer layers in the later stages of their evolution. <clears throat> and as stars, live their lives, particularly as they die, they create new elements. And so the hydrogen and helium from which the universe um, that existed and were formed by the early universe are enriched over time by heavier and heavier elements as they are forged in stars. <clears throat> um, and so uh, over time, the, the interstellar medium becomes richer in these heavier elements. And it is the supernovae that are responsible for a great many of these elements, not all of them, but a significant number of them. Now, because supernovae are so spectacular, then several of them have been recorded as naked eye objects um, over history. So there's at least about 10 or 11 that I could find that have been recorded in the last 2000 years. Um, and what astronomers have done is they've made a link between the, the records of some of these supernovae explosions, these so-called guest stars that have been recorded in history and found where those supernovae explosions have occurred. They found the remnants, in other words, of those explosions. So here are four examples. <clears throat> in the top left-hand corner, we have the Crab Nebula, the most, perhaps the most famous of all the supernovae explosions. Uh, written about in 1054, um, discovered, written about by the, by the Chinese and also Japanese astronomers, it reached um, an apparent magnitude of minus six, so extraordinarily bright, far brighter than Venus at its brightest. It was visible uh, in, the naked, in the day for over three weeks and then faded from view over the next um, year or two. Um, and I'll have a few slides to talk to you about the, uh, the Crab Nebula later. In the bottom left-hand corner, we have a supernova that deserves to be more famous because it was the most spectacular explosion recorded in history. It was apparently 16 times brighter than Venus with a magnitude of about minus 7.5. It's thought to have been as bright as the half moon and uh, apparently you could read by it at night. And this was also recorded in China and, and other countries in the Middle East and Europe. In the upper right-hand corner, we have uh, a historically very important supernova called SN 1572, also known as Tycho supernova, or it was not discovered by Tycho Brahe in the 16th century, but made famous, it made him famous. He, he made the most accurate observations of the supernova, um, the position of it over time than anybody else. And he wrote about it extensively and he was able to demonstrate that because it did not show diurnal parallax, it did not appear to move against the background of stars as the evening progressed, that it must be much more distant than the moon. And in fact, that it must be as distant as the other stars in the constellation of Cassiopeia in which he saw it. And therefore it contradicted the teaching of the ancients that there could only be change in the heavens from objects that were nearer than the moon. Um, apparently he had just, uh, done some alchemical experiment and stepped out of the abbey from which he'd done that experiment and looked up at the sky and was astounded to see the supernova. Um, it was a star that was much brighter than all the other stars 
in Cassiopeia, about minus four. He said it was brighter than Venus. And in the bottom right-hand corner, we have um, Kepler's supernova, uh, discovered in 1604, about which he wrote extensively as well. And um, what's quite interesting is that the T.K. Brahe and Kepler knew each other, so they're the only pair of supernovae uh, discovered by people who, two individuals who knew each other and who were so prominent, of course, in the history of astronomy. Um, <clears throat> so this slide shows you um, an example supernova that went off in a uh, photograph from the, um, in the galaxy NGC 5426, um, about 50 million light years away. And, and really the purpose of showing you this is, is that the spe how spectacular these objects are. So this, um, the supernova is the, is the bright star that you see in the bottom left-hand corner. And it looks for all the world like a foreground star, but in fact, it does occur in, in the galaxy and it easily outshines, is comparable in brightness to the nucleus of the galaxy and, it, and uh, outshines really the entire galaxy. And that just shows how spectacular these, these objects can be. And here's another example in M101, um, which is about 21 million light years away. And it's the arrowed object that is the supernova, a type 1a supernova. Um, and although there are many other stars that look comparable in brightness, those are actually foreground stars. And so this one genuinely belongs to this galaxy as well. And, and so uh, is comparable in its brightness, at peak brightness. So here I'm showing you the two main mechanisms by which supernovae are formed. Uh, in the upper in the upper diagram, the upper part of the diagram, a supernova that is created from a white dwarf. So, and in the lower diagram, a supernova that is created from the collapse of a massive star. So if we look on the, on the left-hand side, we see a, a cloud, a molecular cloud in the galaxy. And it's from molecular clouds that all stars are believed to form. And they form from gravitational collapse. So, uh, an overdensity in a particular part of the cloud, as long as there is sufficient material uh, yeah. present, and as long as the temperature is not too high, so that the atoms of the, the gravitational accumulation are not moving too fast. And those are the conditions under which gravitational collapse occurs. And over time, as, as there's a greater accumulation of material, so there is a greater gravitational potential. And so long as there is sufficient material, that process will continue. And at some point, nuclear fusion reactions will occur in the center of that star, provided it becomes massive enough, more than eight, about 8% 8 of the mass of the sun. And for stars that form, uh, that are approximately less than 11 times the mass of the sun, they follow the upper diagram. And all stars, as they reach the end of their lives, will expand to become red giant stars as they shed their outer layers. Uh, due to changing nuclear processes in their center. And they will shed their outer layers in, in planetary nebulae, as described here. And then the core, what is re remains of the star, will be a white dwarf, and this will be the fate of the sun as well. Now that white dwarf will not itself become a supernova unless it accumulates material over a certain limit called the Chandrasekhar limit, approximately 1 to 1.4 times the mass of the sun. And at that point, if that occurs, and we'll talk more about that later, then a supernova explosion, a runaway supernova explosion will occur. And that completely destroys that white dwarf. And that is called a type 1a supernova. Those are the brightest kinds of the common supernova, the type 1a and the core collapse supernovae. There are rarer, much even brighter supernovae, but I will cover those in a slide later. These cover the majority of the supernovae. And that is called a type 1a, and I'll describe why it's called a type 1a in a moment. In the lower half of the diagram, we have stars that are greater than 11 times the mass of the sun. They will expand to become red supergiants towards the end of their lives. But rather than forming a planetary nebulae, or they, they may form, they will lose some of their outer layers, but nevertheless, they will undergo a core collapse, a dramatic and spectacular collapse which causes a, what is called a core collapse supernova. And depending upon the mass and some other properties, um, but chiefly the mass, for less than 25 times the mass of the sun, the original mass, a neutron star will be formed. And for greater than 25 times the mass of the sun, a black hole will be formed. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on those in the presentation. But just a, just a 
quick word on the distinction between type one and type two. Um, it is rather confusing. Type one supernovae do not, they're based on their spectra. So type one supernovae do not have hydrogen in their spectra. Um, and type two do have hydrogen, but that distinction doesn't reflect the mechanism necessarily. So it is only type 1a that undergo the supernova, undergo white dwarf explosion as a supernova. And it is type 1b, 1c, and 2 that are core collapse. And that's, I find, I personally find that quite, sometimes find that quite confusing. Uh, type 2 are the most common of the core collapse. Uh, type 1b and c are rarer. And type 1b and 1c are very massive stars called wolf riot stars. Type 1b, um, they, don't, they don't have hydrogen. Uh, but they have strong helium lines and type one, and they don't have silicon lines. And type one C don't have hydrogen or helium or silicon lines. Uh, uh, what I should have said earlier was that type one A do have silicon lines. So we, you don't need to remember that for this presentation. It was just to try and to describe to you quickly why there are these different types. Um, but it's not the separation between type one and type two isn't. Uh, a clean separation of the different mechanisms. It's only type 1a, which are the white dwarf explosion type. So this is a, a graphic uh, of, a, of a core collapse supernova, um, but this just illustrates that this is now the, the mechanism which I wish to discuss with you, the core collapse supernova. So before we talk about core collapse supernovae, a quick word about atoms. Uh, I'm sure many of you will know this, but it's quite useful as a reminder because nuclear physics and the structure of the atom is so fundamental to understanding what's going on in a supernova explosion, and in particular, the creation of the elements, which is what I want to concentrate on. So the atom is structured in a schematic way in the following. It has a nucleus, which consists of neutrons and protons. Protons have a positive charge. Neutrons have a, do not have a charge at all, hence their names. And they are surrounded by one or more electrons, depending upon the element. So the element of that atom is determined solely by the number of protons. And in a neutral atom, each of the electrons, which have a negative charge, is equal to the number of protons, which have a positive charge. But in, in a given atom, there may be, as I will describe, uh, one or more variants called isotopes, which vary in the number of neutrons in their center. By the way, the nucleus is tiny. It's not, this is nowhere near to scale. If you imagine the, the atom being the size of a cathedral, then the nucleus about the size of a fly. So there's a very, very extreme. Um, the nucleus is, is, is extraordinarily small. Here's a few uh, examples, uh, which we will discuss. So here is hydrogen, the simplest of all the elements. And it has a single proton and, no, and, and hydrogen itself has no neutrons, no and of the blue circles in its center, and it has a single electron. And then if we look at helium, the next most, the next heaviest element in the periodic table, it has two protons because, and if, if we go to carbon, that has six. So as I mentioned, the number of protons determines the element. Um, uh, and um, what I'm showing you here is in helium, we have two neutrons and two protons, and in carbon 12, neutrons and six protons. So each element has a symbol represented by the H and the HE and, and the C. The bottom left-hand number is the number of protons and the, num and the top right, top left-hand number is the number of neutrons plus protons. Uh, so hydrogen actually has three isotopes. So these are three variants of hydrogen where the number of neutrons varies. So we have deuterium. The middle one is deuterium, hydrogen two with one neutron and hydrogen three is tritium with two neutrons. And, and so, so not expecting, not asking you to remember them, I don't remember them myself, but um, it's, just to, it's just to show you that each element comes in a, a, can come in one or more varieties called isotopes, and those isotopes vary the number of neutrons. And that will be important as we go on. These are the isotopes. So having said that, um, the sun is converting hydrogen to helium in its core. That's why it is producing all the brilliant light and the energy that we receive. And it's been doing that for about 5 billion years, uh, for which I'm no doubt we are all grateful and it will continue to do so because it is, of course, the source of all of our energy um, from space. 
and is responsible for sustaining life on Earth. So on the right hand side, we have the, the process, one of the three branches uh, of a rather complicated process that results in the energy, the nuclear fusion that is going on in the center of the sun. And I'm not going to go through this in detail, there's no need to. Safe to say that hydrogen at the top of the diagram, hydrogen atoms are being fused together under the tremendous pressures and densities at the center of the sun, 10 million degrees and 160 times that of water to produce helium. And that process generates energy, uh, which makes the sun shine. So how do type, supernova, type two supernovae occur? Well, before they occur, and as I mentioned before, they only occur in stars that are greater than 11 times the mass of the sun. There are various processes that occur, nuclear processes. So a star is the gravitational balance between the compression of uh, gravity, compressing hydrogen into the core of the star where the density and the temperatures are highest. And that creates nuclear fusion because the temperatures and pressures are high enough. And as a result, that generates a lot of energy. And so the star is in what is called hydrostatic equilibrium. There is a balance between the gravitational uh, pull towards the center and the energy that is being generated by, those uh, by that nuclear fusion uh, towards, the, towards the radially outwards from the center of the star. And the star is in balance. And all stars on the, what is called the main sequence are doing this. So hydrogen is being converted to helium in the core. Now, at some point, hydrogen in the core is going to deplete. That will reduce the rate of the reaction and it will cause the core, that will, that will mean that gravity starts to win and it will compress the core. And in doing so, that, relate, that heats up the core and it will heat it if the star is massive enough, greater than about 0.5 times the mass of the sun, then helium will be, start to undergo fusion itself to form carbon and oxygen. And this is what will happen in the sun in about 5 billion years. So if we zoom in, at this stage, we have a helium being converted to carbon and oxygen in the center, surrounded by a shell of hydrogen being fused to helium. And that in turn is surrounded by the rest of the star, which is hydrogen. And remember, this is for stars in the later stages of their lives. Now, if the star is massive, is sufficiently massive, then the same process will occur. The helium, process, the helium fusion will start to subside. Gravity will start to win again, and the core will collapse again. And that means that for stars greater than eight times the mass of the sun, they will undergo carbon fusion. Now, to the chagrin of chemists, I'm sure, astronomers refer to nuclear fusion as burning, which is a bit of a misnomer. In, in common language, because in common language, uh, burning only involves electrons, whereas fusion involves uh, the nuclei. But nevertheless, astronomers refer to this as carbon burning. And in carbon burning, we see the formation of elements um, such as neon, magnesium, and sodium. Uh, and with, with extraordinarily high densities now, three million, gram, 3 million times that of water, about 500 million degrees centigrade. And the process goes on. So if for stars that are greater than 10 times the mass of the sun, they will undergo um, processes shown here, not um, so the, the lower one is fusion, creating neon this time fusing with helium to form magnesium 24. But in these temperatures, we have a great many, we have gamma rays, which are the highest frequency form of electromagnetic radiation. And they cause, um, they can cause what is called photo disintegration. So amazingly, this is where a form of light, gamma rays, is able to disintegrate heavy nuclei such, such as that of neon and create, and that is also a mechanism for creating um, elements uh, in, in stars. Uh, and here we see the formation of oxygen-16 and helium-4 in that process. Here we have oxygen burning for stars greater than 10 times the mass of the sun forming where oxygen is being fused together to form 28 silicon and 31 sulfur. These are the primary reactions in, in this stage of a star's life of sufficiently massive stars. And the final stage for stars that are 11 times or greater the mass of the sun, then we have a very important stage where 
uh, silicon is being both disintegrated, is being both disintegrated and uh, by um, gamma rays in the, in the first reaction to form magnesium and helium, but also fusing with helium to form sulfur, argon, and calcium, and also the what are called the, the iron peak elements, titanium, chromium, iron, and nickel. And this is the final stage where you have breathtaking temperatures of 2 billion degrees centigrade and temperatures about 4 million times that of water. Um, and this is, this is the moment, this is the, the final moments of the star. And in fact, in silicon burning process, typically only lasts one or two days. So the star has really reached the end of the road and it's reached the end of the road because those carbon, those helium, sorry, those iron peak elements, particularly iron, cannot fuse any more from other, cannot fuse together with other elements or themselves anymore, because in doing so would require the absorption of energy. And so there is no way to support the rest of the star once the star has reached this point. This is just summarizing the reactions and showing you on the right hand, the, the right hand column, just how rapidly um, the, the time period decreases for each of the carbon burning, for each of the uh, nuclear burning stages, decreasing, as I mentioned, to just one or two days for silicon burning. The, the figures on the right are for a 20 mass solar mass star. So what we end up with just before this critical moment when the star collapses is an onion layer structure with chiefly iron in the center, followed by a layer of silicon, then oxygen, followed by carbon, helium, and then finally the, the remaining envelope of the star as hydrogen. And this is, the, this is the moment of truth. The star can no longer fuse together helium to support itself, and gravity finally takes over, and it does so in a spectacular fashion. The remainder of the, out, the, um, the core is compressed very dramatically by the crushing in, the collapse of the star. And that collapse occurs, is, occurs over a very short time period of about a quarter to half a second. And so you have, a, you have a, a core of iron, chiefly, which is about the size of the moon, about 3,000 kilometers in diameter, collapsing to an extraordinarily dense object, chiefly made of neutrons, called a neutron star, that is about 20 to 30 kilometers in diameter. And it does so at speeds of up to, at, at, at the highest speed of about 20, just under about 23% of the speed of light. So it is quite breathtaking. And um, so we see that in step, step two. Uh, and, and step three is the formation of the neutron star in the center. Now that neutron star um, consists, as its name suggests, almost entirely of neutrons because of, um, first of all, the photo disintegration of iron uh, by the collapse and the gamma rays that are present, but also something called electron capture. This is where the protons that are in the nuclei of the elements, of those iron peak elements, are absorb electrons and in that process called inverse beta decay, neutrons, the protons turn to neutrons. So the vast majority of the nuclei um, are, are neutrons and those neutrons are compressed together to a breathtaking extent to about the density of a nucleus, about 10 to the 14 kilograms per meter cubed. And that is what provide in, in 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 the supernova? What provides the resistance? Basically, the, the the neutron star compresses and then it rebounds. This is what is thought to happen, and it's that rebound that throws causes a tremendous shock wave to erupt from the center of the star, shown by the solid red circle in steps four and five, and to blast away the remainder outer layers of that star that you see in in step six. Um, and this process is extraordinary. Um, it produces uh, the energy, the total energy is about 10 to the 46 joules. I'll talk about that in a moment. And the instantaneous power of the explosion, which is the instantaneous rate of energy being lost, being, being generated by the system, is about um, 
4 billion times that of the Milky Way galaxy. And some sources say that it's, it's great. It's, it's about the, entire, the power of the rest of the entire visible universe. So just one star producing that tremendous amount of power. So that is the, that is the mechanism by which core collapse supernovae are believed to occur. Um, and the total energy, as I said, was 10 to the 46 joules. And that may not be very much. A joule is the system international uh, standard unit of energy. It's the energy that's required to move one kilogram by one meter, but 10 to 46, therefore, may not mean very much. But it's about the equivalent of the entire energy output of the star before it went supernovae over its entire lifetime. I think these stars have very short lifetimes. They're, they're, they're sort of James Dean of the stellar world. They live fast and die young. Um, but uh, over that 10 million years, obviously, it's, it's producing a tremendous amount of energy. They are um, very luminous stars. Um, but in the supernova explosion, they expel that same amount of energy again, just in that fraction of a second. Um, so the light from the supernova, sorry, I should have said over the, over the, over the, year of the brightening and then the fading is the total energy is 10 to the 46 joules. But the light accounts for about only 1% of the total of that. So that's quite extraordinary. So we have these tremendous explosions, these tremendous supernova explosions, and yet light is only point, you know, one ten thousandth of the energy that's emitting. The debris from the, from the, from the explosion is about 1%. And the remainder, astonishingly, is completely invisible to humans. It is in the form of neutrinos. Neutrinos are um, elementary particles that have almost no interaction with matter at all. Millions of them are passing through us all the time. They're generated by uh, the stars, uh, the sun uh, in particular, um, and other stars, and in supernova explosions, as I've described, and at the beginning of the universe. Uh, but almost no interaction at all with matter, very, very difficult to detect. And yet, almost all of the energy is in the form of that invisible form of um, energy neutrinos. So that was the core collapse, which is the type 1b, 1c, and 2. Um, sorry, beg your pardon. I'll now describe to you the, sort of the white dwarf um, mechanism, the other mechanism for supernovae, the, the, the type 1a, if you remember. So if we, if we go back, you may remember that there was a, a stage where um, stars that are uh, greater than um, point five times the mass of the sun will undergo, sorry, um, yes, 0.5 times the mass of the sun will undergo helium burning, and they will end up with cores of carbon and oxygen. And this is, this is the fate of the sun, it's the fate of the majority of stars. But um, in such stars, less than 11 times, less than eight times the mass of the sun, then there will be no further stages of burning. And so they will end up being white dwarfs, as in the later stages, the hydrogen and the helium envelopes are lost through powerful stellar winds. This is what will happen to the sun, we'll end up with a, a white dwarf, approximately the size of the Earth, an extremely dense object um, of what is called degenerate matter uh, that makes up the white dwarf, the electrons providing the pressure against which gravity is, is, is preventing that material from um, being collapsed further through something called the Pauli exclusion principle. So we have, the, we have a white dwarf. They're extremely common in the galaxy. Um, and here is an example, a very famous example, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, is the ring nebula. We see the star in the center. This is the white dwarf. It's pretty hot. It's probably about 11,000 degrees uh, centigrade um, or Kelvin, um, producing a lot of ultraviolet radiation, which is illuminating um, the, the envelope that has been shed here, the outer layer, the outer gaseous layers, and this lovely spherical, although it looks circular, um, nebula, shining in the various, various uh, bands due to the ionization of different elements within that nebula. So that itself is not the supernova explosion, but as I mentioned earlier, if that, super, that white dwarf can accumulate more material, because it's definitely less than 1.4 solar masses at this point, it's probably you know, less than a solar mass, in typically 0.8 solar masses, but they vary. But if it can accumulate sufficient material to reach 1.4 solar masses, then it will become a supernova. And there are two main mechanisms thought possible. 
On the left, we have the accumulation of material from a partner star, a star that it's in orbit with, a main perhaps a main sequence star or a star that is evolving. And as it does so, its outer envelope is being attracted into by the gravitational attraction of the white dwarf, shown on the right hand side in each of the panels on the left, um, into a accretion disk. And that accretion disk will ultimately dump material onto the surface of that white dwarf. And if it reaches 1.4 solar masses, a runaway thermonuclear reaction will occur. And the whole star will be disrupted. And a spectacular supernova is the result of type 1a. Now, this is actually not thought to be the most common mechanism. Um, one of the difficulties with this approach is that there doesn't appear to be the hydrogen that you would expect in the spectrum from the envelope of the main of the other star, the, 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 the partner star. So the other, the, this other mechanism on the right hand side is thought to be the most likely where you actually have the orbiting of two white dwarf stars that that would be common as well. Um, any any partner star uh, will evolve off the main sequence too. Um, most stars will become white dwarfs and, and many stars are in binaries. So this is expected to be common. Um, and over time, as they orbit each other, gravitational radiation will remove angular momentum from the system and they will in spiral together. And when they collide, as in the bottom panel on the right hand side, that too will produce the same supernovae. This is what is thought to happen. So here's just a nice little animation, if it works, of that process. It's not going to, is it? Because it's a demonstration effect. No. Hmm. Oh, well, I'll try once more. I'm not having much luck, am I, to it's not It works at the running astronomical system. Anyway, just imagine two stars <laughs> orbiting each other, colliding and going, going supernova. That's a bit disappointing. Anyway, I apologize. I, I won't hold you up any longer. I'll we can try it at the end. So how a crucial question is, how do elements heavier than iron form in the universe? Because so far, I haven't described a mechanism that does this. And one of the chief mechanisms is thought to be in the explosion itself. So this is what I will describe to you. And the answer, perhaps surprisingly, is neutrons, and also a process called beta decay. Now, up to now, neutrons have played an important role in producing the explosion of the supernovae, um, but they also have this other role as well in this context. So I want you to imagine that we have a, uh, an isotope, which is, would be common as in the core of the supernovae, just as, as, it is, as it goes supernova, in the iron core, if you remember. And this one is iron 56, and that means that it has 26 protons, as the red balls in the upper half of the nuclei, and 30 neutrons, shown by the blue circles. Now, what I'm going to show you now is neutrons coming from the left and making and, and adding there, making this element very neutron rich. And that, that's the first stage of this process. Remember that in the core of a supernova, there is a tremendous flux of neutrons um, because of iron capture electron capture rather, and the tremendous densities involved. So very schematically, I'm showing the, 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 the collision of neutrons at very high speeds into this iron nuclei. And as I do so, you, you may notice that, I'll go back, so I didn't describe it, iron, that 56 is incrementing by one, becoming iron 57 as each neutron is added, because the top left-hand corner is the number of neutrons, protons plus neutrons, so the lower number doesn't increase. It's only the upper number. So now we have 57 nuclei, 58, and the, um, the half-life of each of these particular isotopes of iron is different. And they tend to become much shorter as you add, new, as you add neutrons because the nuclei is becoming unstable. And I'll describe what half-life is in a, in a slightly later slide if you're not sure. So that, there's an exception there, iron 60 does have a long half-life. But then you have iron 61, which has a half-life of six minutes. So I'm going to assume now 
that one of those five extra neutrons actually turns into a proton by the process called beta decay. And this is the crucial step. So in, in beta decay, a neutron can decay into a proton and in the process release an electron and a neutrino, but we don't need to worry about that. So that top neutron that I've just added is now going to turn into a proton with the emission of a neutron, neutrino and an electron. Now, if you were watching that lower symbol, you would have noticed while that was happening, you would have noticed that iron turned into cobalt. And that's the key step. Now we're having transmutation of elements, a form of stellar alchemy in which one element is being changed into another because the neutron is changing into a proton by a beta decay. And th therefore, this is the way that heavier and heavier elements are produced in the supernova explosion. It's called the R process, and it happens again and again and again and again. And this is how it is believed. Elements heavier than iron are created in supernovae, in the explosion itself. So let's look now at, this is probably the, I would say the most important slide really, because it is illustrating in the periodic table and how each of the elements and what the source of the creation of those elements is color coded. So for example, um, the elements that are shown in the darker blue, the Big Bang fusion elements, as they are labeled, as they are color coded, formed at the beginning of the universe, hydrogen and helium and a tiny bit of lithium. Um, beryllium and boron, number four and five, were formed by cosmic ray fission. They are the exception. Um, they're not formed in stars. But the all of the rest of the elements up to uranium are thought to occur either in supernovae, which are the green and the light blue color-coded elements, or the merging of neutron stars, because merging of neutron stars can also produce the process that I showed you just now. And perhaps surprisingly, there are dying low mass stars, the, the so-called asymptotic giant branch stars, also contribute to elements as well. Though none of them exclusively, none of the, uh, the elements that are produced by dying low mass stars are also produced by other mechanisms. But I want to highlight in particular, the elements that are important, particularly for life, um, these are the so-called Chinops elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And of those, oxygen and phosphorus are exclusively made by supernovae, exploding massive stars. Um, carbon is formed from uh, exploding massive stars, the so-called core collapse supernovae. So when you see exploding massive stars, though, it means core collapse supernovae. Um, also iron. So iron is produced by supernovae, uh, by core collapse and type 1a, and iron is fundamental for life. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an important component of hemoglobin in our blood. Calcium too, uh, essential for our bones. Um, so, and if we show you, if I show you all of the elements that are considered to be um, important for life to varying degrees, it's the ones highlighted in I've, 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 I've added the um, square perimeter to, in the yellow perimeter, so I'm just flashing it there so you can see it more clearly. So you can see that supernovae are responsible uh, for many of the elements. But also significantly, you will notice that merging neutron stars are important for most of the others, most of the heavier ones, including, I, I ought to add, Silver, gold, and platinum. So if you're if you have some if you're wearing some bling, you could look at that bling and be fairly confident it was formed in the in the collision of two neutron stars. But as I will describe, core collapse supernovae produce neutron stars. Neutron stars only come from core collapse supernovae. So either directly or indirectly, supernovae are producing most of the elements heavier than iron, and many of those are important for life. So it just shows how significant. Supernovae are. Um, so I did mention radioactive decay and half-life when I talked about beta decay a couple of slides ago. So I want to just mention that the half-life of a given isotope means the time it takes for half of those nuclei to decay to another, another isotope. 
And we're answering rather one, one thing that I think is rather wonderful about supernovae studies is that as they decay, after they have reached their peak brightness, we can correlate how fast they, directly, how fast they decay with the experimentally verified half-lives of various isotopes. So you see how they, type 1, type 1a and type 2, how they decrease over time once they've reached their peak brightness. And we can relate that directly, the speed of that decay, directly to the half-life of the decay of nickel 56 to cobalt 56, and similarly from cobalt 56 to iron 56, of half-lives in six days and 77 days, respectively. And there are other examples too, uh, in our observations of how fast these objects decay, which I think is a rather lovely and direct connection between what we have measured in the laboratory and what we see out there in the universe, um, which gives us confidence that our uh, understanding of the physical is one of the ways in which our understanding of the physical world is verified uh, on vastly different scales and uh, vastly different phenomena. So I've got a, a couple of slides now on, on two supernova explosions. I've only got time range for a couple. This is the very famous, of course, Crab, su crab Supernova Remnant, um, about 6,500 light years away. Um, it is the remains of a core collapse supernova, and we know that because it has an object at the center of it that is detected by radio astronomers called the Crab Pulsar, which is pulsars are detected neutron stars detected by the, via the mechanism of the, the um, they're, they're each believed to have beams of electromagnetic radiations that shoot out from their magnetic poles. And if their magnetic poles are at a different, are displaced from their rotational axes, then they will, uh, that those beams will sweep out like lighthouses. And if they are intercepted by radio telescopes, then they are detected and their properties measured. Um, 30 years ago, I was a member of the um, Jodrell Bank Pulsar Group, and I remember we had a telescope that was dedicated to this pulsar 24-7, uh, because I think it is circumpolar, even though we can't see it, we see it at night. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, and the, the remnant itself is, is expanding, and that, that can be detected. So, um, in, in, in it within, easily within a, within a decade, it can be measured. So, um, the, the various filaments, if we separate out, um, the, if we filter this by wavelength, then, then this, then we see the various elements, these are the, you know, the outer atmosphere of that supernova, uh, and we see the elements of oxygen here. I think, I think this is, this is uh, oxygen one. Um, this is sulfur, sulfur two, singly ionized sulfur. Um, and this is the, the infrared uh, Spitzer observations of the Crab Pulsar. You can see this, this beautiful structure and you can begin to see what is actually the, the, the crab pulsar in the center of that bright object. And the great complexities of the infrared radiation being given off here. Uh, some of this is thermal, but much of it is what is called cyclotron radiation. In other words, radiation created by electrons spiraling along the magnetic field lines of the object in the center. Uh, and these, this, this, this radiation uh, the radiation from the Crab Nebula and the Crab Pulsar occurs right across the electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves, uh, infra microwave, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X-ray and gamma rays. It's a fascinating object. And at the highest wavelengths, at the X-ray and gamma ray, ray well, Chandra picks up X-ray uh, wavelengths. Um, and in this beautiful image, we clearly see um, the, the material that has formed around, uh, highly energetic material that has formed around the pulsar. We also have a, uh, a jet which is colliding with the, uh, the material previously shed by the, by the pulsar in the bottom left-hand corner. Again, we see the wispy, ghostly, ethereal cyclotron radiation emitted by the electrons in the magnetic fields of the pulsar. Now, the pulsars are breathtaking objects um, they are the most physical, they are the, the dense physical objects known. They have densities comparable to that of the nucleus, as I mentioned before. Um, and, and their magnetic fields are extreme. So before the supernova uh, collapsed, before the, rather the, um, the, the massive star that created the pulsar collapsed, it was spinning. And that angular momentum was conserved 
as the core collapsed, which meant that the resulting neutron star spanned very fast, like an ice skater spinning with her arms outstretched. As she brings her arms inwards, she will spin faster. And this is what is happening with, with, the, with the pulsar. Um, so the, the crab pulsar is spinning 30 times a second. And as it does so, it is uh, transferring its energy from the beams of radiation into the surrounding uh, into the surrounding nebula and slowing down as a result, but it is slowing down very, very slightly. It's about 10 to the minus 15 of a second per second. So uh, very, very, um, very slowly. And the accuracy with which the pulses can be measured um, rivals that of, of atomic clocks. So here is a rather lovely uh, combination of X-ray, optical and infrared produced by uh, you know, Chandra, Spitzer and the Hubble Spitzer. Chandra and the Hubble Space Telescope and Spitzer, respectively, into what I think is an extraordinarily beautiful image. Uh, you can just appreciate it beautifully. There's so much structure, there is so much dynamism, there is so much that is intriguing. Uh, it's, it's very, very beautiful, I think. Um, so here is a rather lovely, this death animation is working. So an amateur over a period of, uh, between 2009 and 2018, has created a, a set of Images which illustrate the, both the expansion of the crab pulsar and the dynamism that is occurring in the center as electromagnetic particles are being blown away from the tremendous winds of the, um, crab, of, of the pulsar itself. So that, that's rather lovely. Uh, moving on to another very famous supernova, supernova 1987A. Um, this is the, the, the closest uh, supernova that has gone off to the Milky Way uh, within the modern era, within the within the you know within the telescopic era, um, there have been no um, naked eye supernova in the Milky Way galaxy since uh, since Kepler's in 1604. And this was naked eye. It wasn't as spectacular as the four historical supernova that I described. It's about magnitude two, but it was certainly visible. And what's unique? It, it was unique for a few reasons. First of all. The original star as arrowed, this is a pre-supernova. On the left is the pre-supernova explosion arrow, uh, the image rather, of the, of the star, known as Sandalik minus 69202. Um, surprisingly, it was a blue supergiant. It wasn't thought at the time that blue supergiants could go supernovae, but uh, this has demonstrated otherwise. And now, now it's accepted and understood. Uh, but on the right-hand side, we, we now have the, the, the amazing uh, post-explosion uh, image. Um, so that, that, that's in itself, I think, is remarkable. Um, the subsequent observations showed a rather strange and intriguing structure, which is still not properly understood, and this will be a target for the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, it has a, what appears to be three rings. It has a ring which is coplanar. The central uh, beaded bright ring is, is coplanar with the, um, with, with the, uh, the progenitor, well, with the with the um, supernova, the remnants of the supernova, um, which as it was also now thought recently to have found to be a have a pulsar. Eventually, a pulsar was discovered uh, quite recently, um, and also two other rings, um, which may be which may indicate that it has a bipolar structure. So, this is a simulation. It's not an, it's not a photograph um, where we see this bipolar structure. So. The, the, the inner ring um, was jettisoned before from the supernova before it went supernova, jettisoned from the star rather before it went supernova, and has constrained um, the, the, the supernova explosion itself to be bipolar rather than spherical. In fact, supernova explosions are not, are not in general thought to be uh, as spherically symmetrical. Um, but anyway, um, and, and, the, and the, the, outer, the outer two rings within this sort of hourglass shape it's not quite clear how they occur, but it may be because this pulse, that there is an unseen binary companion which is creating jets itself of electromagnetic radiation, which is somehow ionizing that and so sort of painting circles on this bipolar outflows. But I don't believe this is properly understood uh, and is the subject of ongoing study. Um, now, another wonderful thing about this supernova was that it was really the birth of neutrino astronomy. So these, this is um, measurements taken by um, the 
I think it was the Kamiya Khan 2 neutrino detector in Japan at the time. Uh, time is from right to left, and um, you can see there's a dramatic spike in the number of neutrinos detected. I think only 11 were detected, but it's clearly above the noise, which you see in the bottom part of the diagram. There is, in fact, a gap um, before, so from the right, there is a substantial gap, and that was a gap of, under which the, the facility was undergoing maintenance, so we're very lucky that it wasn't undergoing maintenance. When the supernova went off, they didn't realise at the time, they weren't monitored, they didn't realise um, that they had a spike until they were told to look for one by the people, um, I think it was Pittsburgh University, who had sent them a note, maybe it was Toronto, sorry, Toronto University, had sent them a letter saying, please look to see if you've had detected any neutrinos from this supernova explosion, and, and they did find them. And uh, I think that's rather wonderful because the detector itself is not directed at the pulse. It's not directed in a particular location in the sky. It's, it's simply in a, in a, in a large tank. Um, I think it was underground. And, 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 but still detected a, a spike. Uh, and, 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 the, and therefore these neutrinos were undoubtedly from the supernova explosion itself. There were two other detectors as well that found a fewer number of, of neutrinos confirming the result. Um, but it was the birth of neutrino astronomy caused great excitement at the time. I've actually already talked about pulsars um, when I talked about the Crab Nebula, but this is a schematic of a pulsar. And these are only produced in super core collapse supernovae. There's no other mechanism to produce them. And as I mentioned, they are extreme objects, um, incredibly dense. Uh, a teaspoon of, it's quite common to hear that a teaspoon of a neutron star weighs about 500 billion tons, um, metric tons. If you were to drop an object from just a meter above the surface of a neutron star, a pulsar, it would hit the surface at about 4.3 million miles per hour. Um, that is, you know, absolutely extraordinary. And, and they, are, they almost always spin very rapidly. Um, the quickest one, there are millisecond pulsars. So these are spun up by their parent stars. Um, but there are also a, a few very long period relative for pulsars that spin once every few seconds. Um, and as I mentioned, there are tremendously accurate clocks. Um, and so they are so extreme that they bend the light. So if you, if you, if you dared get close to one, I mean, you wouldn't survive. But if you were to get, if you could detect it, you would find that the, 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 the reverse side of the pulsar would probably, or part of the reverse side would be visible to you, such as the distortion of light from the surface, such as the intensity of the gravity. Now, I also mentioned briefly earlier on that um, some particularly massive supernovae, greater than 25 solar masses, uh, will actually not form pulsars, will not form neutron stars, rather, but that, the, um, that even neutron stars have a maximum mass. I think it's between 2.2 and 2.9 solar masses. This is the so-called tolman oppenheimer volkov limit. And when that point is reached, when, when, the, when the core is so massive that even neutrons cannot resist the gravitational collapse, then the object, amazingly, is crushed out of existence. And what it remains is a black hole. This was, um, I gave a talk on black holes, um, you may remember, to the society in 2019, some of you may remember. And um, what forms, of course, what forms is an event horizon around that black hole um, from which light cannot escape, internally from which light cannot escape, and so hence the name black hole. But they can be seen, uh, one of the ways in which they can be seen is via the accumulation of material from a parent star, which in the similar case to the explosion of the white dwarf, forms a scenario that forms a um, accretion disk. Um, and that itself can be is highly luminous, particularly at its hot spot, as you see in the right hand corner. And some, not all, but some um, instances of this will produce jets as well, as in this. Uh, this, is, this is an illustration. Um, this is, how stellar, this, this is how stellar mass black holes are produced. Now, I have given you a slightly simplified picture of the mechanisms of supernovae. There are, there are certain mass ranges which, uh, where we get different um, kinds of supernovae. 
one of which is the um, is the pair instability. So very, very massive stars undergo what is called pair production, where gamma rays um, uh, collide with nuclei to form electrons and um, positrons. And that removes balance, that removes pressure, that removes radiation pressure, which causes collapse, dramatic collapse, um, and complete collapse as well. So I don't, um, so a pulsar won't be produced. It's complete collapse to what is thought to be a black hole. Um, and these are very, very rare and possibly thought to be what the first stars in the universe underwent. The very first stars were thought to be extremely massive, underwent this kind of process, formed stellar mass black holes, although large ones by stellar mass black hole standards, and over time may have merged together to form the supermassive black holes that we find in the center of galaxies. So a very important mechanism, but a very rare mechanism in the, in the current universe. And in this um, penultimate slide, supernovae, type 1a supernovae, the white dwarf explosion supernovae have, have provided a, a, an excellent mechanism for determining um, how the universe has expanded uh, in its relatively recent history and have demonstrated that in fact, this, the, the expansion of the universe is not slowing down as was supposed before the discovery. Um, in the late 90s, but is in fact accelerating. Um, quite why it's accelerating is due to something called, that is euphemistically known as dark energy. It's meant to be an energetic property of the vacuum itself, um, but its actual cause is, is uncertain. Um, and it's, it's because super, type 1a supernovae are standard candles, which means that they have, after a, a small adjust, after an adjustment process, um, they have the same, lumino same peak luminosity, and therefore, if you can see them at greater and greater distances, you can not only measure their redshift, you can measure their density, their distance as well, which allows you to establish how fast, at a given epoch, at various epochs, the universe is expanding. Hence, the discovery that it is, in fact, in the recent, relatively recent, I think it's about five billion years, the universe has been expanding instead of decreasing, uh, decelerating as we see in this diagram. Um, initially, in the Big Bang, it would have accelerated, then it would have decelerated, and then the last five or so billion years, um, radiation energy, sorry, vacuum energy, would have dominated the other radiation component, the other energy components in the universe, they being uh, light and matter and radiation to produce this accelerating effect. So this is uh, a very important um, consequence of, uh, of supernovae. This is a very important contribution that they make. So just um, really to finish up, um, to go back to the slide and to conclude that supernovae have allowed us, uh, are extraordinary for many, for both the understand, not only their understanding is a tremendous achievement by, by scientists, but it's allowed us to um, compare what we find in the laboratory to what we uh, confirm uh, in supernovae explosions by measuring their spectra and detecting the various elements that are produced. Um, it's a tremendous testament to human ingenuity um, from a theoretical and also an observational and practical from um, the creation of the wide range of experiments to study and instruments to study these uh, supernovae explosions in all areas, in all wave bands of the electromagnetic spectrum, and also now, of course, neutrinos, and more recently, um, the neutron stars that are created, gravitational wave physics. Um, but perhaps the most emotional aspect, if you like, and the connection with human beings is that supernovae are responsible for a great many if not all, either directly or indirectly, the elements that are, are extremely important for life. And so it isn't too fanciful to say that we owe our lives to the supernovae. Thank you very much. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Brian. That was uh, another excellent talk. Thank um, you very much. Yeah, well done, Brian.
I'll, uh, Thank you. I'll share my video. I'll ask if uh, if anybody has any questions for Brian before we stop recording. Uh, I think I've got one. <clears throat> yep. Um, Brian, you mentioned uh, about the the two possible sources of a of a Type One A um, supernova, yes. which which have generally been considered to be the standard candle uh, by which we can measure the distances uh, of the universe. Um, yes. So the, the, the one that I'm more familiar with is, is the first one you described, which is where you, you have two, two objects in a binary system, um, one just below the, the 1.4 solar mass, accreting material from a, from a binary neighbour. Yes. And as soon as it gets to 1.4 solar masses, the, the so-called Chandrasekhar limit, it goes off as a supernova. And therefore, mm. all type 1A supernova are supposed to have the same intrinsic brightness. Indeed, yes. Hence the, the, the standard candle. Now, the, the other yes. mechanism you mentioned is two neutron stars spiralling together and that causing a, also a type 1A. I meant to say, did I say neutrons? I meant white dwarf. So. Uh, okay, e either way, sorry, two, two white sorry. dwarfs. Yes. Now, if that happens, you, you suddenly end up with more than precisely 1.4 mass, solar masses. So oh. surely in that mechanism, the type 1A is, not, is no longer a standard brightness. And therefore you can't use that as a standard candle to measure the, the, the distance ladder of the universe. It never occurred to me before until, uh, until you, I, I just saw your slide. But doesn't that rather throw the, um, the cat amongst the pigeons as far as type 1A being standard brightness objects it does doesn't it and i have to say i have never thought of that before and i've never read it i've never read anything about that so i think you've got me there um certainly in the, back in the uh, 1980s standard candles were uh, considered good if they were within a factor of 10 uh, with yes. two white dwarfs colliding ah, okay i guess you were you're it's less it's usually less than a factor of two a factor of two I think, the I, maximum. Yeah, yeah. So I think there there is variation, but I don't know if that's the I don't know if that's the intrinsic reason, because you would end up you know, a wider variety of, of of total total mass, as as um, as Trevor rightly says. Um, but there is an adjust there is an adjustment procedure called the stretch procedure, um, which is used to um, to calibrate them all. But I don't I don't know the details of that procedure. But there is there is a mechanism by which they can all be normalized. Um, I think it's fire studying the properties of the spectra. Um, uh, okay, so from the spectra you it, can tell it's a type 1a, but you can also tell whether it was the merger of two white doors or whether it was from accretion from a, a neighboring star. What I meant by that is that you have to, it gives you the information you need to be able to normalize it to the, the, the template uh, light curve, and therefore, um, um, determine its, yeah. But I, I have I have to confess, I um, I'm not sure of the details of that. It's called the stretch method. Okay, thank you. Um, so that, that's a very very good question. It may be that only 1.4 solar masses of the total mass. Is responsible for the explosion. Um, but that seems a bit unlikely. Um, you would certainly be left with the remainder behind. Mm. And the usual, what my understanding is that the entire the, the entire system is obliterated in the in the process. So it's a, an absolutely excellent question. I have never I've never come across. I've read a lot about supernovae, but I've never come across that, and it never occurred to me before. So. So it's only taken me about 30 years to come up with that question. <laughs> That's question. Uh, um, something may occur to me. Anybody else got a, 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 a question for, for Brian? Yes, Scott. please. Oh, well. Go ahead, go. Richard. Brian, hi. Um, I was going to ask that question, honest. <laughs> but I've got <laughs> another one. I've got another one too. Um, uh, on your elements uh, page, you've got techniques. Yes. You've got technetium and um, 
promethium grayed out. Yes. And presumably that's because they're radioactive. Yeah, that's true. They're all yeah. the, sorry, I should have said that, all the isotopes are extremely unstable. Yeah. So, but they, they would have been produced, I presume, but they've just. I, I presume they've so decayed. too. They've decayed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They've decayed, but they haven't been detected. I don't think the daughter, it, it's probably that the daughter elements are amongst the elements, amongst the isotopes that have been detected. Yeah. Um, but I don't know for certain. Great. Thank you. And John, I think you've got your hand raised. Yep, indeed. So um, I was uh, most intrigued by uh, your um, chart of the uh, periodic table showing that uh, most of the very heavy elements uh, were partially created from uh, low mass stars. And that's um, it's most interesting. How? So um, there is there is what's called the S process. So um, shall I share my screen? Yes, please. Please do. Um, share screen. It's not working again, of course. <laughs> So, um, so many of those, yes, are the dying low mass stars. In dying low mass stars, you, you do get the, the production of neutrons as well, um, but it's, it's called the S process. So um, in the S process, you will get decay of accumulated neutrons or much quicker, the, the, the rate of decay is much quicker than the rate of accumulation of neutrons. And, and, and those isotopes tend to be more stable. So there's, there's something called the value of stability, which is for increasing atomic mass, those element, those isotopes for each, for each proton number, which are most stable. And in the S process, that hugs, um, the S process produces heavier and heavier elements, but those elements which are closest to the value of stability. So yes, um, it, it's quite amazing. Yeah, it's not, none of them, None of the dying low mass stars exclusively produce, I suppose yttrium is the closest, and, and strontium possibly, um, exclusively produce any of the elements, but they do, they do make a significant contribution. Yes, yeah, quite amazing. But of course, there are a lot of them as well. There's, there's a lot more of them than there are the supernovae. Mm -hmm. But there are, they do produce neutrons. Um, in, the, in the asymptotic giant branch stars at that stage of their evolution, they do produce uh, neutrons. Yep, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's so amazing. It's a wonderful really slide, isn't it? I mean, it produces, yeah. it has, you know, it's responsible for the amount of research that is behind that periodic table is, is, is extraordinary. And I, I've given this talk tw two other times, and, 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 you know, that has proved to be a source of considerable interest to the, to the audience. Yeah. I'd like to come back to that in a minute, but first I'll ask Mark as a question and then the JBS. So, Mark, if you'd like to ask your question. Okay, I was just going to ask one question. Is, is, um, is they doing a time lapse thing on 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 your supernovae on on, on the one the nearest one to us? Is anybody it's doing crap. a study on it? Doing a, a time lapse on it or not? Well, it's certainly heavily studied. Um, you may well be able to find um, time lapse. Um, I haven't found one myself. On, on I don't know if anybody was doing it. Supernova night at eighty seven A. Oh, okay, thank you. I think John, haven't you yeah, done crab? But I mean, it wouldn't. A, it was, you know, I don't think we would find. Um, I don't know if there are the supernova as as it exploded. There weren't any images, so there was a there was an image beforehand. It was discovered on on a plate, on a photographic plate, um, one evening uh, by the discoverer. But there wouldn't have been images. There wouldn't have been photographic plates taken as it exploded, if that's what you mean. But there would have been. You know, there's many, many observations as, as the supernova remnants exploded, as they expanded over time. Uh, I, I'm not conscious of, but I haven't seen uh, a time lapse of that particular one. But, um, uh, but that when you're showing the pictures earlier, the slides with the two two pictures of it, and you can see the differences by kick backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Oh, that's quite a difference that was. That was so that was which crab. was that supernova 87A? What, what the showed the crab. The crab. Oh, it's the crab. Yeah. So I've, I, I showed you a time lapse of the crab. I hope it worked. Yeah. 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 Um, and so I believe John John Murphy, you've got images that well, just, over the just, years that's shown. Just, in, just, just to say, so, sorry guys, 
Adam, Adam Block has done a video. If you search it on YouTube, there's a, a 20 year time lapse of the Crab Nebula in really quite high definition by Adam Block. Sure. Okay. So I'll show it you again. Can you? I'm never sure whether you can. Is this presenter mode or is it in? It's in oh. regular. Pre it's regular. Mode. So here we go. Can you see that? No, uh, we're still on no, your got, presenter mode. Screen. We've still got the table of elements. Oh. That's it. Oh, that's better. Yeah. Is that right? Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I can see presenter view. So, yeah. um, so can you see that time lapse there? Yeah, time? I was just saying that's how that's moving is quite good, quite good, isn't it? Yeah, it's beautiful. It's really yeah. astounding. It's so yes, yeah, so I thought you meant 1987A, by the way, when you when you first asked me. But this is much closer than 1987A. I mean, 1987A is about 185,000 light years away. Sure. It's not in our galaxy. It's in the Magellanic Cloud. One thing I didn't say actually was where supernovae are found. So core collapse supernovae are found in regions of um, high star formation, such as the supernova 1987A was in the region of the 30 Doridus, for example. And so when we see them in other galaxies, we find them in the spiral arms. The type 1A supernovae seems to be found almost anywhere. Um, although I did, I was quite surprised when I tried to find records of supernovae going off in globular clusters where you'd expect them to be because you get very high density of white dwarfs and black and of white dwarfs in um, globular clusters, but apparently not. I couldn't find any. Amazing. Yeah. Fantastic. That was. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you, Justin. Uh, Justin's posted Adam Block's um, link in the in the chat for anybody that's interested. Oh, oh yes. And um, John, you've got a JBS, you've got a question for Brian. Uh, yes, uh, th thanks, Brian. Um, is there any evidence to suggest that a supernova explosion is a pure plasma and gas explosion, or is it a splattery explosion with shrapnel in it? Oh, it has debris, definitely. Um, so that so the, the star itself is disrupted. And so that, that material is gas, you know. Um, you may have dust that is created in the later stages of the star prior to going supernovae, but it, it is, there is a mechanical component and it is of the, the envelope of the star, which is gaseous, even though it's very high, high density towards, you know, in the inner part of the star. So it, it is all, um, so the material will be gaseous that is exploded rather than solid. It's not, it's not an explosion of a solid object or a liquid object, but it, it's gaseous. Um, and about 1% of the energy is, is in that, contained within that explode, that components of the explosion, but the vast majority is, is neutrinos. Okay, my, my thoughts were that um, although it might be gaseous um, and it's highly compressed and at a very high temperature, um, in the process of the explosion, uh, the pressure will reduce very rapidly around a clump of material that's being accelerated out away mm, from yes, the indeed. Door. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, and the, the reduction in pressure would also cause a reduction in temperature. So the yes. temperature would fall very rapidly. And it might be fast enough to uh, maintain its structure. It'll have enough local gravity to stay in a lump rather than be pure plasma. Um, and that lump could then form the basis of a future asteroid. I mean, undoubtedly, yes. I mean, un undoubtedly, that you know, there are lots of. So in supernova, in, the, in supernova 1987A, there was that ring of material um, that had been jettisoned private previously to the supernova, and then there was the other two, the bipolar material that was shed out, shed by the supernova. So. There's definitely a lot of material being ejected, and there is definitely material um, from, I mean, all the asteroids, for example, that the planets ultimately come from are ultimately made of the heavier elements of the periodic table. And as we've discussed, they are produced, many of them, by supernovae uh, or neutron stars or, or 
and many of them are produced by supernovae. So, so ultimately the answer is definitely yes. So we'll have whether whether um, it will take it will take a while for that material to cool and to, to gravitationally coalesce, coalesce to form that material. But ultimately that is where all the planets and asteroids come from. Ultimately. So yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Well I'm I'm suggesting that um it starts coalescing much earlier in the uh, the explosion cycle. Um, in other words, it doesn't get Possibly. finally divided before it co coalesces. It starts off coalesced. And... Well, I, possibly, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it's expanding at an enormous velocity. And that expansion would overwhelm any gravitational collapse of a small component. Yeah. If you had a small element, a volume element, it would be expanded trem at tremendous speeds, yeah, radially away from the from the center of the explosion. I mean, you have to remember that actually these these explosions are not spherically symmetric; they're actually extremely complicated, and there's a great deal of um, turbulence going on and asymmetry in the explosion. But I wouldn't expect gravitational collapse of a clump to occur in the early stages of the explosion because of the tremendous momentum given to that object, and much right. of the and much of the material is maintained at a high temperature by the radioactive decay of the ice of the ice isotopes present in it, as I described, in, in the light curve. So its temperature overall is still is still very high, and it, it decays relatively slowly, much slow, on a much longer time scale than I think you were suggesting overall. It doesn't mean to say that every part of it is doing so, but the bulk of it is doing so, and I think it would be much later. That the material of that would actually coalesce, so not within the initial uh, seconds to a year, but rather on the order of hundreds of thousands to millions of years. That's what I would expect. But thanks. Yeah, that's answered my question. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, so I've, I've got one for me, and um, perhaps it goes back to the chart, and uh, again, possibly a, a fairly hot topic in that it relates to James Webb mm, and the mirrors. Yes. Uh, are made of beryllium. And if we notice from that diagram, the beryllium is formed from cosmic ray fission. Yes, uh, that's right, spalliation of cosmic so ray. So is, is, does that mean that is, that, is that happening during a supernova or what's the... Because um, <clears throat> I suppose it goes to help to explain really why beryllium I don't think, there. I don't think, I don't think it's happening in supernovae. I think it's happening, um, by either primordial cosmic rays or by cosmic rays formed by supernovae and stars, um, but not in the supernova explosion itself. Mm -hmm. okay, um, I got the impression it was primordial, but it may not be, or it may not be known. Yeah. But you can't form beryllium and boron from nuclear fusion. But I couldn't, I couldn't promise you that it's not happening in supernova. I don't, I don't believe it is happening in supernova explosions. I don't believe it's detected in supernova explosions or that, that it's theoretically, that it, there, is, it, there is a theoretical product, prediction that it's occurring in supernova explosions, the formation of beryllium and boron. Thank you. I see more Google is required. Thank you. So anyway, if nobody else has any further questions for Brian, I think... Uh... Uh, There's two more hands up. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Two more. <laughs> sorry, I missed. Uh, um, I'll go to Simon first because Mark's already had one answered. Oh, thank you. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes. Um, great. Um, I noticed even though it's a different process, the similarity between that bipolar structure of uh, supernova 18, uh, oh, sorry, 1987A and planetary nebula of that yes. bipolar structure. Yes. It's yes. almost as if there's a similar process. I, I, I think there is, yeah. Different. yeah. I don't think it's completely different. I think it's to do with magnetic fields. I, I didn't mention that, actually. It's magnetic fields threading around um, the, the circumstellar disk that is constraining um, the outflow. We see this in Eta Carina uh, and, and uh, the planetary nebulae. Um, there's, there's the butterfly nebula as well, and the cat nebula, uh, where the, the role of magnetic fields um, has, is a strong determinator and a very complex determinator of the final shape of these objects. And um, it's rather beautiful, isn't it, the, the bipolar out, outflow, but it is thought to be the presence of a circumstellar disk combined with the magnetic field threading it. Yeah. 
And jets, maybe. Yes, and jets, absolutely. Um, yeah. Supernovae are um, that sort of collapse our model of, of Stan Woosley has um, jets being produced as the as a massive star collapses and gamma ray gamma ray bursts are thought to be I think short gamma ray bursts are thought to be supernovae explosions with with gamma ray bursts beam towards us. Yeah. yeah. So, the, so the beam of radiation is, is coming towards us uh, and being accelerated by uh, special relativity, according boosted by special relativity, but appears to be more luminous than it is. If you if then then it. If, if you assume it's isotropic, then you you would conclude that it, the the overall luminosity of the of the supernova was was much greater than it is if it's if it's just a beam coming towards you. Yeah, the analogy to that, I suppose, is the uh, the image of the black hole where you could see the bright parts because the relativistic speeds towards us, and yes. the dark parts with the yeah right. Yeah, so we have, we have jets and black holes also connected with magnetic fields. Jets are fully understood, intriguingly, that it's thought to be, um, you know, the, the channeling of the beam, um, constraining and the channeling of the beam due to magnetic fields surrounding the objects and then um, threading the poles as well. well. It works in cathode ray tubes, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. And Mark, you have another question for Oh, uh, no, sorry, it's still stood up. I don't know why it's still stood up there. I can't get rid of it. Okay, don't worry. Don't okay, worry. don't worry. I said I finished. Thank you. I had my question. Very good talk tonight, Ryan. By the way, Can I just ask a question as well. Thank you. Sure, just. Um, I, I I was wondering. Um, this I think it's probably not high enough proportion, but I was wondering whether, sort of, from early generation stars, which are comprised of just hydrogen and helium, to stars that might be generated now, is the proportion of elements they're being created from? Because obviously, stars now are going to be made of some of slightly heavier elements mm -hmm. significant enough to actually change the life cycle of the star so that it's starting with higher mass elements as a proportion so um when it comes to supernovae the mass the, the, the pitch the position with higher mass stars whether they become supernovae or not um so i i i, I described a fairly I describe the, the standard picture of stars below a certain mass becoming uh, not capable of becoming core collapse supernovae, and and uh, and and but for higher mass stars, so so for 11, greater than eleven but less than twenty five, you form neutron stars, for example, and greater than twenty five, you form black holes. But for if mass isn't the only um, factor in the in the destiny of a black hole. Destiny, sorry, of a supernova. Um, but to go into that would have been rather onerous. Uh, but there is a rather useful table that I found, which describes the fate of higher mass, um, higher mass supernovae. I happen to have it here. And the fate of, for example, stars that are 25 to 40 solar masses, which I didn't go into specifically, with a very high met metallicity, they tend to form neutron stars, but with a low or solar mass um, metallicity, they form a black hole, but only after the material is formed. So there was an initial neutron star, it did, it, the material rebounded, then some of that material fell back onto that neutron star and caused it to go over the TOV limit, the Tolman Oppenheimer Volkov limit, and form a black hole. And the difference between those two is thought to be the degree of metal, what's called the metallicity, which is the proportion of the star, which consists of elements that are heavier than helium. So that's an example where the metallicity of the proportion of the elements heavier than helium in a star does dictate uh, its final outcome. So it's not simply a function of mass, but there are, there are, there are many of those cases. And so um, it is still broadly true that the very heavier mass stars, greater than 25, form black holes and the lower mass, less than that, form neutron stars. But if you include the, the, the metallicity, there are certain mass ranges where that is the exception. That's very cool, thank you. It's all right, so it's, it's, it's most interesting, but I think, you know, it's a, a lot, there's a lot of, a lot of um, theoretical modeling has gone into that, you know, to understand the role of metallicity in supernovae explosions. Um, and I think it was on a separate note, 
it was in 2017 when new, a pair of neutron stars was detected to have collided via, via LIGO. And the, and the, and the, and the, and the subsequent uh, multi-wavelength observations, the so-called multi-messenger astronomy of the, of the supernova, of the, of the consequence of that collision showed that you could form elements such as silver, gold, and platinum uh, by colliding neutron stars. Which isn't directly what you were saying, but it's it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting um, it's an interesting point of discovery. Okay, well, thanks once again, and uh, perhaps a, another round of applause for for Brian, please. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. I uh, <laughs> I only wish I knew the answer to Trevor's question. I think that. Was <laughs> That was an absolutely brilliant question, and it's really got me. Um, Come back now, and uh, with the answer. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to try to. It, I can only imagine that it's either one of two things: either that is responsible for the variation nobody's noticed, and 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 because I've not read, I've not read that it is, but I, I've not read either what the true cause is of the variability in Type One A. It is quite subtle. It's not a. It's not a factor of ten. It's you know the the stretch mechanism. If you, if you see a stack of type 1A um, light curves, they're all pretty close. The stretch method, method is about normalizing them to a particular template, mm. but only by a small fraction. It's not within a factor of 10. Um, but uh, I, I'm not sure whether that's, you know, whether that's responsible for the variation or, or simply, or some other mechanism. Well, you may find that in the in whatever forum you pose that question, if everybody suddenly gets a shock on their face and runs away, you know you've upset the apple cart. <laughs> I'll, I'll apply for the Nobel Prize now, shall I? <laughs> please do, please do, please do. <laughs> I think you should. That that could solve dark energy and dark mass and all sorts. If, if that's um, true, isn't it? <laughs> well, it would Don't mess up a lot of calculations. Up I, I'm sure it's. I'm sure there's a simple explanation. Well, it's a real pleasure to talk to you, and um, thank you very much for inviting me.